episode of the SDSU podcast is sponsored by Mars Energy Cream, the first ever topical energy delivery product. Think energy drink, but it's a lotion. It contains a proprietary blend of natural ingredients, including caffeine, taurine, and B vitamins to provide an energizing boost. And unlike traditional energy drinks and gels, Mars Energy Cream is sugar-free, contains no artificial flavors, colors, or preservatives. If you want to try it out, go to MarsEnergyDrinkCream.com and use the code Andre, spelled A-N-D-R-E, at checkout to receive 15% off a purchase of a 50 milliliter tube. Listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagberdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, back to the SDSU podcast. I am your host Andre Hagberdian, joined as always by Mr. Paul Garrison. What's going on, Paul? What's going on, Andre? I, I, it's nice. You know, you finally get a slow San Diego State week. You know. There's nothing really going on. Um, I'm not really sure if we're going to be able to fill enough time to actually do a podcast. I mean, there's just, there's nothing to talk about. Yeah, it's been a slow week, you know. <laughs> the uh, the the news of the week, obviously, came out Monday morning. Coach Hoke announced that he's retiring at the end of the season. He's going to finish out the season and coach the last two games. San Diego State. And J.D. Wicker are, are off and running with a, a coaching search to see who the next head coach at San Diego State is. You know, I, I couldn't find how many prior head coaches San Diego State have had. So I didn't know, like, who that next coach will be. You know, usually they'll say that next coach is the 20th coach in history. I don't okay. know. If, what's that? I said, oh, okay. Yeah, but I don't know. I couldn't find that number. Uh, maybe I didn't dig hard enough. But, like, you know, it's – it's always exciting for something new. You know, I I, I personally um, wasn't surprised of the news. Maybe I was surprised at the timing. But uh, I, you know, after these last few games, especially since the Nevada game, I think the writing was on the wall that there was going to be a separation at the end of the year. Well, whatever means that was, you can you can use whatever terminology you want in terms of the separation, retirement, parting ways, mutual agreement, uh, firing, whatever you want. But I, I think it was heading to that point. And now it's important for, you know, CNU State to to make a hire and, and uh, see where they go. What were your thoughts? Well, I, I honestly, I have a different take than that. Um, I think that uh, if he didn't retire, I think he'd be the coach next year. I do not think that uh, when after hearing J.D. Wicker describe who he wants in a coach, he described Brady Hoke. Listening to the players and the respect that they have for him, I think that he would have deserved, and if he had wanted it, the opportunity to right the ship if that was his choice. Um, he talked about that he... Um, Going into the season, this was going to be a conversation that he was going to have with his wife. I think that, uh, you know, maybe another way to say it is, I don't know that J.D. Wicker had to make a choice. How about that? Um, that 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 this was something that, that they had discussed that w- was a possibility. And Hope decided to walk away, as he said, for his own on his. Uh, he's the one who made that decision. And, you know, just the, the the emphasis on that, I think that the, the genesis of that, you know, I, I think that Brady Hoke should have been. And if, if, if uh, I'll say that, I'll say it another way. If J.D. Wicker had chosen to fire Hoke, I think it would have been the wrong decision. And that, that he should have been allowed at least to, an opportunity, given everything that he has meant to this program. And I would argue, if we wanted to get into that side, which we shouldn't, because um, it's really immaterial. I, I think that uh, Hoke's tenure not winning a Mountain West championship in 2000, in 2021 was severely hindered by the administration in um, making him have to, you know, and then and, and with everything that was going in the rape allegations and the timing in which they um, had Brenda Tracy come 
on the week of the championship game. I think that that really made it to where that was almost a forfeit. Um, I think that, you know, his overall legacy is going to be like, I think a little bit more tarnished primarily because he never won a mountain West championship. And that was the only chance. And, you know, they, they weren't able to put their best foot forward, but I agree with you in terms of how important this upcoming hire is. Um, I'm really curious to see how closely Wicker sticks to uh, what he said he's looking for. It seemed to me, and we can get into this, but it seems to me that that a young coach would would almost be kind of eliminated from the comments that he made. Yeah, there were definitely interesting comments. One last thing about Hope, and you know, we can agree to disagree on the circumstances of uh, why there's a new head coach going to be next year, but. I, I, your our perspectives for San Diego State are different. Like you're born and raised in San Diego, you've been a San Diego State fan for your entire life. You know, spanning cl- over forty years, right? I'm not. You know my my first year at San Diego State in grad school was 2010. That was also the first year I had season tickets for football. Like mm-hmm. I don't know San Diego State before Coach Hoke, really. Uh, right. Obviously, I knew who Marshall Falk was and is, and uh, some of those other guys. But like, I wasn't a, a I didn't watch San Diego State games, right? So like this year, sure. you know, th- th- this is why this year was so tough because it's the first losing season at San Diego State since I've been actually paying attention to San Diego State. You know, so like I don't really know how this feels in in a crazy way, and that's why this year was so tough. You know, not just as a fan and an alumni, but a person that covers the team and is around the team. And there was just, it was a really challenging year. Uh, We obviously, both of us want, we're both alums. We bought, we want San Diego State to be great. We want them to win and we want this to be a joyous team. And otherwise we wouldn't do what we do, right? We Both of us have like full-time jobs, right? We wouldn't do what we do for EVT and the podcast on our own free time you know, for no pay, unless we absolutely love the team, whatever you want to say about the circumstances in some way, there is some intrigue and some excitement about bringing in a new coaching staff. The 19th. This would be the 19th head coach or hopefully the 19th head coach, the 19th head coach according to the, the media guide. Yeah. So that that's just, that's why I think it was important. Like where, whatever the circumstances are, based on how this year has gone, I think uh, looking for a new head coach and bringing in a new staff and, you know, developing new relationships for us with the new staff based on the, the, the fortunate role that we have, I think is, is makes me kind of look towards, you know, spring camp and things like that a little bit differently, you know, maybe a little bit more excitement in, in, involved in that. I honestly, and maybe this, like you said, this goes back to the history of it. I get excited for, every Aztec season and have since, uh, you know, I was a little kid. Um, so I, it, I, I honestly, you know, again, I, I, I thought, and I thought you're, you're, you sent up a tweet about it. Um, and if anybody is listening to this and they have not listened to Garrett Fountain and Martin Blake and what they said about Brady Hoke, all I can say is, and Andre and can say this as well. This is every person who's ever talked about Brady Hoke to us. Like that's not the first time we've heard two people kind of at loss for words trying to describe the impact that Brady Hoke has had on them. I have in my entire life never met, never known somebody that people almost revere. Uh, and, and, and you know, he I, Brady Hoke has um, obviously is one of three coaches to take, um, to win 11 games with three different teams since 1996. One of two coaches, a bigger part, and one of two coaches, Ur- 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 Urban, Urban Meyer. Meyer. Yep. And yeah, and to win with three teams, 11 wins with three teams, one of two coaches. And so he does have that success. He won a Sugar Bowl. You know, he coached at the, the highest level compared to Urban Meyer and everything Urban Meyer did in winning national titles at all those places and stuff like that. Like Brady Hoke, um, maybe because he only did it once at Michigan and the other ones were at G5 schools, like his the idea of who he is as a coach, maybe people don't, you know, his, the reverence people have for him is because of the type of man that he was, the type of husband that he was, the way in which he carried himself 
the way in which when Garrett Fountain, he talked about something, if he had a family issue, like he missed practice. And that was okay. And he, and there's so many coaches who, who that's like, no, like your priority is here and nothing else. And anything else that goes on with that, it's negative. So it, it was just, it's just an amazing thing that, that Brady Hoke was able to do that. And, uh, you know, that aspect of it, it would be shocking if they found a replacement for that aspect of Brady Hoke. I've been thinking a little bit about the legacy of Brady Hoke. And I think the place where Brady Hoke is elite is as a, culture starter at Michigan there, you know, they, the last coach before Jim Harbaugh was Brady Hoke. And it took him seven years to, to meet the success that Hoke had in his first season. And people say, well, he took Rich Rodriguez's players. Great. Yes, he did. And he was able to, in every place that he went to instill a culture of like toughness, competitiveness, camaraderie, that you have to win in order to play in football. And there's been so many times, I mean, I'm thinking of like um, Lincoln Riley and all the all-world talent that he has at SC, all the world talent that he had at Oklahoma. And he could beat other teams that didn't have the talent, but the most, the, the moment other teams close in talent came to him, he's always lacked, I think, what Brady Hoke always brought to a team, which is that competitiveness, that toughness, that ability to play for each other. And I, I think that, that, um, you know, Michigan continues to reap the success of undoing what Rich Rod did there and all of the losing that took place before Brady Hoke. You know, I think the hard work of that, the heavy lifting of that he did before handing off to um, Rocky Long. And um, it's interesting because what do you think, like long term, people are going to think about Hoke and his place in San Diego State coaching history? Well, I, unfortunately, I think a, a lot of people are going to remember this season because it's what have you done for me lately? Um, I don't look at it that way at all. You know, good coaches can have bad seasons, just like good players can have bad seasons or bad games, things like that. I don't think Brady Hoke just forgot how to be a coach or a good coach. I think this season was just a collective effort among all the coaches, all the players, administration. I think not having you know, having so much of the crowd be empty for some of those home games and the lack of atmosphere that came with it was definitely uh, a problem that I don't think it, I don't think it made the team worse. I don't think it helped the team overcome maybe some of those games where they lost one possession at home that they could have, like Martin Blake talked about it. Like fans don't realize that their one yell and their one scream and their one chant could impact one play in the game that ends up deciding the game. And, you know, obviously administration has some blame in that with ticket prices and, and atmosphere and so forth. And there's, there's blame to go all the way around. I just, just I'm going to remember him as a guy that started the culture, started um, 13 straight years of bowl eligibility, you know, 42 years of coaching shows that he was a good coach. He was a great coach. This season was, was, is an outlier to me, but um, I don't think it was his best season, obviously, and the, and the team's record shows that. That doesn't take away the type of person he is, his character, his work ethic, his integrity. Uh, it just didn't work this year for various reasons. And, you know, it's, it's going to become an, a new uh, a new day for San Diego State. But I think his legacy is intact as a winner, despite the fact that some people right now are only looking at it uh, in a different light based on what's happening today. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, the, to me, I think what the, his long-term legacy, I think that as the years go on, things start blending together and you, you know, it's hard to, yeah. you're going to just look at this year, but I really think that the best comparison to what Brady, how Brady Hoke is going to be long-term is Claude Gilbert. Um, mm -hmm. Claude Gilbert uh, followed Don Coriel was a coach for eight years, had a lot of successful seasons, especially immediately after Coriel. And yet when anybody talks about, like old school coaches, he's almost an afterthought. And I think, um, interestingly enough, I think in the same vein, when people remember the 13 years, they're going to remember Rocky Long. And then other people are going to have to remind him, well, you know, <laughs> Brady Hogue did also have a big part in that too. So I think Rocky Long will be the ones who was remembered for this era. And like Claude Gilbert, I think, you know, uh, Brady Hogue is going to just kind of be that guy who's kind of lumped in, like Gilbert is lumped in with Coriel. Yeah, it's, it's it's just an interesting, interesting day, and and um, 
let's talk a little bit if we could uh, before jumping into, I don't know, Colorado State or San Jose State, if we, how we want to do that. What do you think J.D. Wicker, by his comments, you know, what do you think he's looking for as far as, um, you know, the next head coach? Well, I think he told us what he's looking for. He, the, I think the most interesting thing he says is a West Coast presence. He wants a guy that's been on the West Coast and has recruiting ties to the West Coast. And I think in some ways that can narrow down the field. But, he, you know, he, I think recruiting has to be front and center on this next hire. Um, one thing he also said, which I thought was interesting, is he wants somebody that not only will be a great coach, but he'll, they'll be an ambassador to the culture of San Diego state academically and making sure people are, you know, be, being, you know, staying out of trouble. In other words, he didn't use that word, but that's essentially what he was talking about. A head coach that will embody the culture and the values of San Diego state academically, character wise, and uh, athletically. Aztec fans have, have had this list of head coaching candidates, you know, all for years, right. Which is fun. It's fun to speculate. And there's a long list of them, and there's a lot of great names on there and a lot of great coaches, but there's probably a few coaches on that list that probably wouldn't meet that criteria in terms of their past experience for whatever reasons, for whatever circumstances. So I think he's looking for somebody that has doesn't have quote-unquote baggage that, uh, that other coaches might not have. And, you know, as he said, he's not looking for – a guy that's specifically offensive or defensive, he's looking for the best coach. But he did say, if it's a defensive guy, then I want to know what their plan is offensively, who their coordinator is going to be, and what they're looking to do offensively. Because he has noted, he noted against in our interview, he noted it on Tuesday, he noted it uh, on Jim and John and Jim on Monday as well. You know, he understands the entertainment aspect of the offense and what he's heard from fans. So. That's that's a that's a long way to say he's looking for someone that could come in and jumpstart and excite this fan base, but also someone that's going to embody the values and continue the culture that Coach Hoke and Coach Wong have you know had for the last fifteen years. Yeah, and it's that last part that I find the most interesting because it would almost seem that if that was your goal, that the only first time head coaches that you would bring in would be guys who have been here before. Yeah. Um, right? I mean, it, like, like, how would you know whether a person could establish a culture and could bring a culture and could do all of those things if they've never been a head coach before or they don't know what San Diego State's all about? Yeah. Um, and so that's the part of it that I found the most interesting was just, you know, he also talked about, we're not going to have 50 guys go into the portal and bring in their own players and all that kind of stuff. So for the part of the fan base that, you know, really would like to see, you know, a Dion esque kind of like purge of the program, which again, that would be another kind of, uh, if you were bringing in a first year guy, you would want them maybe to bring in all of their players and all of those kinds of things. Um, so that led me again to believe that, that like some of those, some of those like big hires, I think, um, you know, maybe the, the Washington offensive coordinator um, who, you know, has been in the Mountain West, looks like a group, but has he ran a program? Would he be able to come in and know how to do all of those things? Um, and then, you know, the, the interest, but then the other side of that is all of the guys who you could bring in who are part of that Brady Hoke, Rocky Long tree are all defensive guys because they've had all these offensive struggles for all of these years. And so that's just it, man, it's just, it's such an interesting aspect of it. I personally do not think that they need to get a rock star guy. And only for this reason of all of the great uh, attributes that coach um, Hope possesses uh, being great at a press conference is not one of them. You know, obviously, we've enjoyed all of our time interviewing him and appreciate all the things and stuff like that. But compared to other people, like that's not his strength. And if they bring in somebody who's not a star, 
but who is very well spoken at press conferences and can and and can carry the room and and makes you enjoy watching a YouTube video and you know you can put clips on and it's like you sound he sounds you know in charge and all of those kinds of things. Um, just because he contrasts Rocky Long and just because he contrasts Brady Hoke, that person will look like a star to the San Diego fan base. If that makes any yeah. sense. And Absolutely. so I think that I think that they don't have to necessarily get. Uh, that'll create enough buzz, I think, by the fan base. And I think that's a really big key to uh, some of the stuff that you just described is getting a communicator, getting somebody who can get out in front. I mean, there, there's people on staff like like Ryan Lindley does it. Ryan Lindley, you know, when when you interview him and you talk to him, he's a commanding presence and, and he does all of those things that I think a lot of people said felt like Brady Hope did the first time. He was here and then a decade later, you know, did not have that same kind of firing command at those press conferences. But I, I that's the, that's another interesting aspect of it. Uh, and then the other piece of it is, is that I felt like it wasn't just the culture of the football team. I think it was the culture of the entire athletic department. Um, so like, you know, some people were talking about, you know, Chip Kelly potentially getting fired at UCLA. And would that be an offensive guy and stuff like that? And I think there's a lot of really great things to like about that idea. Um, I think that he would bring instant cachet as far as, you know, recruiting. I don't necessarily think that he would be ready to leverage it for another job. But I don't necessarily know that I could see Chip Kelly, you know, having a conversation with Ryan Hopkins, the 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 head coach of the soccer team and them having that you know in the same house that camaraderie at least by reputation right that he's going to kind of be to himself and he's and and so that wouldn't fit what jd wicker has is building with san diego state and not just for the football program but as kind of like the flag flagship program being able to to affect everybody else um and so i just find that piece of it to be really really interesting I, another I, question Go ahead. i don't yeah, Chip Kelly is as not, I don't consider him a fit at all. I don't even think he's that great of a coach, to be honest. Um, it's that Oregon scheme and system. He was the first to run it. That yeah. really um and he had the Heisman Trophy winners and super talented guys that run it. And since then, it hasn't worked, really. Um, where in the NFL it didn't work. And at UCLA, he's about to get fired because it hasn't worked, despite bringing in talented quarterback talented you know receivers and things like that so i don't frankly think he's a fit or a great coach there's other better candidates but you know if chip kelly is is given the job i'm going to go back and delete this uh section before the first <laughs> yeah yeah no I'll, I'll have it on a megaphone at the end of the <laughs> conference no i you know and again i i mean i i don't i i just mean that like that would be the kind of offensive hire that would like sell tickets like i i agree that you as an astute person who really like understands x's and o's and pays attention to some of the things in a deeper way but like people who are just casual fans would be like they got chip kelly like let's go like he's yeah. been on he's been on my television every day for the last 15 years like this is a great hire for san diego state and and i don't mean it like i actually think that it could be a good hire to, to be honest with you. Um, I think that uh, he's become more of a defensive coach as time has moved on, which I think benefits winning. But, and I mean, their UCLA's defense has, has really become really special. You know, I was only bringing him up more so just with like the idea of saying like, that doesn't seem to be the kind of guy that JD Wicker's looking for. He he's looking for yeah. that team player, that person who's going to be, you know, willing to share a a building with all the rest of the Olympic sports, but not just share a building, but actually be a part of a team among the other coaches. And so I just I just find that really interesting. Um, I, I think the the idea that we're not looking for an offensive guy, we're not looking for a defensive guy. You know, honestly, that strikes me as they're going to hire a defensive coach. Yeah, uh, before I tell you who I think it's going to be. Oh, you already have a prediction. Wow. Okay. I okay. do. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. I, I maybe it's not a prediction, but it's 
if Andre was making this higher. Okay, that's a death. That is where I was going to end this whole thing. Who's your, um, who's your top candidate? But I was going to say, before I say that is, I think the m- most important thing Wicker said on yesterday was that he expects them to, the base salary for the new head coach to be at the Good top point. of the Mountain West. Yeah. Which is a million dollars more than what Brady Hoke is making. That's a big jump. And Brent Brennan, Craig Bull, they're making 2.3 million. So let's, if we take him for at his word, and obviously he didn't say, you know, didn't put it in, you know, he said we'll be at the top. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the top. It could right. be close to there. But let's say 2.3 million, that opens up a lot of potential off coordinator candidates that are making more than what Brady Hoke was making as the head coach. And I yeah. think that opens up a lot of possibilities. If Andre is making this higher, you remember I'm an L.A. kid. Sure. UCLA fan. Late 90s UCLA were my first college football games and experiences. Okay. Who was the starting linebacker for Rocky Long that those years? At, at UCLA? Yeah. I don't know. Tony White. Oh. That's why, that's where Rocky Long met Tony White. And that's how that connection started for so many years. And he brought him, obviously, to San Diego State. He was an rec- uh, excellent recruiter. He's got West Coast ties. I think he checks every box except one that Wicker mentioned, and that's what it's your plan for the offense. And the only reason he doesn't check that box is because we don't know that answer. Right. doesn't mean he doesn't have the answer. We just don't know what it is publicly. I just think he's he fits. If you, if you basically put Tony White's face next to everything J.D. Wicker said, it would be perfect fit. And he only he makes a million dollars right now at Nebraska. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean, you know, he's not going to get uh, a lot more as a head coach. But, like, I don't think financially it would be an issue. He's got senior state experience. He's got West Coast experience. He's a great recruiter. His defenses at Syracuse and Nebraska and Arizona State have gone up instead of going down every year. Absolutely. I think he would be – and listen to his press conferences. I think people would be impressed. And and if you know, I don't as a position coach, I doubt he got a lot of many press conferences at San Diego State. So maybe San Diego State fans haven't really heard him speak, but you can go watch some press conferences at Nebraska. I think he has a weekly press conference at Nebraska right now. So yeah, he's he's got he's guy at the top of my list. Doesn't mean that there aren't other candidates. And I yeah. think there'll be candidates nobody's talking about that'll pop up that you'll hear, oh, so and so got interviewed, and everybody like. We don't. We didn't think of that guy. So there will be candidates that pop up that we were, nobody's talking about. But I just think Tony White makes a lot of sense. Yeah, in that very very same vein, um, I think Zach Arnett makes a ton of sense. I think that Ryan Lindley is very very beloved. Um, and while people are not going to love the offense this year, you know, I think that uh, um, Coach Lindley is as bad of a coordinator as he will ever be. Um, I think his growth. Is, and I believe there's belief in him in the building. You know, talk about the ability to like keep some of the guys playing there. Um, I think it is about um, keeping some of those coordinators, keeping some of those people. So I think Zach Arnett, you know, checks a lot of those boxes. And then I think that, you know, San Diego State should also be willing to try to, you know, um, do what Colorado State did and, Go take a head coach from another Mountain West school. Um, go yeah. be the big go be the big boys on the block. Um, do you have the coach's salary in front of you? Uh, yeah. Uh, what does UNLV's coach make? Barry Odom. Uh huh. One point seven five million, right? He's the highest paid according 1. to one, according in in December of uh, twenty two a year ago. He was the highest paid. I think you go there and you say, no, no, no. in the Mountain West. Uh, this was when he got hired. Yeah. So he makes 1.785 million. So I think you can go to him and you, if you really believe what he did at UNLV and you say to him, Hey, you got a quarterback there at UNLV who's really, you know, he's a freshman. He's thrown over 2000 yards. Um, and you're interviewing him and you say, Hey, Hey, Barry, 
would, would your would your quarterback come over to? We'll give you two point seven five. And you just you just you 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 big league them like you know the, yeah. the Colorado State did with Norvell. So I think that could be something that could be an in, in, an interesting idea. Um, I think I heard on the radio today. I my um, the, the, um, John Schaefer mentioned in San Jose State's head coach, of course, is there Brennan as they're going to go play them. San Jose State was as dead as you could possibly be. You want to talk about a guy who can like build a culture, yeah, so he's I, I think, and somebody who would like fit into what they're looking for. Now, you know, again, I mean, people are not going to be. I also think that guy is incredibly. Um, what's the right word? I think that guy, uh, Brennan, is is incredibly inspirational, and I think that that just. And, and, you know, he moves a ton on the sidelines. That's always been something people have been critical about Hoke is he's just he's not animated on the sidelines, which Brennan yeah. is, you know. And and so I think that that offers a big contrast. Um, obviously, a West Coast guy, he does have a history of going and getting transfer quarterbacks and being able to to build the teams around them. So I think there's I think there's that route as well. Like, I think you <clears throat> San Diego State is if especially willing to put in that money into it. I think they're at a point where they should look to some of the successful Mountain West schools and see if, you know, if, yeah. if they see, see if they if they like anything that's been taking place at some of those and 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 try to go and grab them. <clears throat> but that that seems to fit a lot more a lot better with than what JD Wicker was talking about, you know. I think I think if JD Wicker was open was more open and again, if you go and you interview a coordinator and you're like this guy has it you know, you got to hire that person. But I think that that it, just by his by what he said, the like hot, young coordinator kind of person that is going to be, you know, what is one vein of taking this hire in, I think that person's going to be behind the eight ball, because it's going to be really tough to go in there and to talk about how you're going to keep San Diego State's culture when you've never built a culture yourself and everything's just theory at this point. I think there's a, there's a lot to like there, a lot of opportunities. I do think it's a fantastic coaching job um, for anyone. Um, and, and, you know, as you say, I mean, these, this next month will be, you know, really, really exciting to see, you know, so many things, who do they hire? What happens to the assistants? Where does transfer portal with all the kids leaving because of this who do they attract in the portal because of this new coach what happens to the recruits um what happens to recruits who you know may have been enrolling early is that possibility still there for them you know and all of those kinds of things i mean there's so many pieces of it and and uh you know uh one kind of uh foreshadowing commercial for ourselves we plan to talk to one next week um, Anthony McMillan, uh, running back from uh, modern day high school in Chula Vista. Um, uh, he's going to be our guest on the podcast and we're going to ask him all these questions. Like what, how does this affect you? What's going on with, you know, and, and, and obviously catch up with Anthony as somebody that we've had on the podcast before. Yeah. The recruiting and the timing aspect of it is so fascinating mm -hmm. because even coach Hoke said, we're still recruiting class of 24 guys getting the, the commits. We're trying to keep them committed. And then new guys are trying to, but like, how do those conversations go, right? Like, if I'm Anthony McMillan, let's say, right? And Kurt Maddox was my recruiter because he's San Diego, but the Jimmy Beal is my running back coach. Like, right. what do they tell me to get me to stay knowing that they might not be there? They'll probably won't be there. You know what I mean? That's such a difficult role for the position coaches right now who are, kind of in limbo themselves, but they're still, they're still getting paid. So they still have a job to do and they sure. will do it. But it, that is just like this human nature aspect of it, of trying to sell a school and a program and a culture when you might not be there. And maybe it's leaning towards you not being there, depending on who the new coach is, right? More, uh, more often than not, the most of the position coaches will not be there next year. Within, when a new yes. Coming. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you're absolutely. gonna have to expect that. So, like, trying to absolutely. convince a recruit, like, that's tough, really tough. I would love to get a coach's perspective on that. Obviously, they're not going to talk about it now, 
Uh, we're not going to have a chance to talk to the position coaches uh, anyway in the next few weeks, but I would love to get a perspective on that because that is, that is, that is tough. It's tough. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I think that's a really interesting. And the only way you can possibly do that is if you were honest and up yeah. front with the kid the whole time. And then you could just be honest, but in like a different way, you know what I mean? And you could say, here's where we're at. Here's the things I love about San Diego state, the education, the, this, the, this, the, this, the, this, you know, here are my plans. Here's what I'm going to hope to do. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough place to, to, to be in. But the flip side of it is, I mean, unfortunately, this is the sport, the the whirlwind and things that are taking place. I mean, who even knows what their conference will be, you know, after after Washington and Oregon State today got. Yeah, I don't even know what they got after they got the opportunity to have somebody appeal a decision. It seems like that's all that happened. Um, but still, you know, it's a step in that in that legal process that that has to play out. But let's go back a little bit, if we could. Colorado State, you know, I, I as we are preparing to go to San Jose State, um, Don and I, um, I'm, I'm pretty like, as this that the season's you know tailing back, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited just that you know we have been able to cover San Diego State on the road with a photographer and a writer each game, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I will say that you know your your one game as the writer in hawaii um you did get the short end of the photographer stick i i I, it could just be coincidence but i think that like after i took pictures in hawaii don's already masterful work and pj's work has like went up to a new level like here rook let me let me show you let me show you how to do this um but (laughs) i mean there are some pictures and if and and don always puts out like a um you know a a photo essay of of just all of his pictures. But I mean, there are shots in there that are just unbelievable. I mean, look in Andre's, if you remember, look at Andre's preview for the upcoming game against San Jose State. And there's this picture where he's getting Makai Shaw, like pointing at the ref as if Makai is pointing at Don. (laughs) And I mean, he looks like, he looks, I mean, that's the quality of a picture as you're ever going to get. The interception that he got of, uh, you know, Sedarius Barfield's interception, um, you know, right in the end zone, right as he's catching the ball. I mean, all of the pageantry that surrounded the game from the flyover to the biggest flag in Colorado and Don's taking pictures like underneath it. And it was just like, it was, it was, we did, we did good work. We did good work there. It did change a little bit of the post game press conference. Um, Go Aztecs put up about, they put three questions, but I asked like, Oh, uh, I, I asked, I think like eight questions. And so five of them didn't get on there. And, you know, a couple of them are just like, Hey, where, where was Ross? Um, Ulugalu Musuli, you know, what happened with him? So there's short little things, but at the very end, I asked coach Hoke about next year <laughs> and I was trying to, you know, see if, Oh, you know, JD and I have been talking or, or just something about next year. How do you build off of the, you know, things like that? And his response was just sort of, yep, it's what you said. <laughs> like it was, it was very, and I was like, okay. <laughs> and they didn't get in there. And I know you saw it because I sent you the whole thing. B, I will say this, like his temperament and his demeanor in that press conference, basically you could tell he knew. I think so. I think so. He's done. Whether, and and we, as we said in the beginning, whatever circumstances and, terminology you want to use for it like i think he knew you could tell for sure yeah 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 so that that was interesting but anyway so uh beautiful stadium beautiful stadium uh i think of all of the places that i have uh visited for a game um in terms of just like you know the rose bowl is historic the rose bowl is amazing cal is amazing built into a, the side of a hill but it just pure like just like sight lines and just taking it as if they were like the first stadium um, definitely one of the nicest I've ever been to, you know, you, you could, th- there was only one thing that did not strike you as professional and about Canvas stadium. And that was the fact that there weren't very many seat backs. And I think you could, I think, I mean, I don't know this, but just my opinion on it, I can imagine JD Wicker going on a tour of that and seeing the exact same thing, you know, the, from the way that, I mean, it, it was just great. I think, uh, because it's older than than Snapdragon, 
um, all of the surrounding area, or maybe it was built into the surrounding area that the campus was already there. Um, but that just gave it a better feel. And then the game itself, man, the game itself was just like, I just, just bad in the first half. I mean, it was, it was, it was really bad. I was, so I was at the, at the women's soccer championship at Snapdragon. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I was, um, I was keeping track of it on my phone. You know, I wasn't watching it, but I was checking the score and, and then I was getting messages and tagged in, you know, social media. <laughs> sure. I, I had an idea before I even checked the score, how things are going. Um, so yeah, it looked brutal through at least uh, through halftime. Yeah. And so, I mean, just, you know, we don't need to do the whole thing with the grades since we spend so much time talking about hope, but um, in general, you know, I think if you could split it between two halves, you know, I think you would go, um, I think you would go F for the offense in the first half. Um, I think you would go uh, C for the defense in the first half. And then I think both of them got A's in the second half. I am curious to see uh, where Josh Hunter is for this upcoming game, only because he was by far the only guy who could tackle on. I mean, like if if he didn't bring him down, nobody was obviously he had 15 tackles, but they were good. I mean, he's uh, I mean, um, Colorado State ran their their offense effectively, and he was matched up against one of the premier tight ends in the country. And I and only like one time did um, did the 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 tight end from Colorado State um like win. Uh, uh, it was a big third down and he broke it was a tackle. big third down. Yeah, he broke a tackle. Was it. But all the rest of them he stopped them short in the yeah. exact same situation. You know, they ended up getting the ball back on a on a fumble on that drive. So even that one didn't kill him. Um but it was a really big game for him. But throughout the game he was injured. He would he would tackle somebody he'd be slow to get up slow and then at the last two drives um he wasn't in the game and eric butler came in and you know as as you know eric butler seems to do every single time that he gets to see the field he made an impactful play he was the one who flipped the the running back and then um and then des malone was one who stripped it out and then um virus picked it up so I'm curious to see how healthy he is and if he's going to be able to to go um, on on Saturday. Um, because of that, he was in the backfield. He was making open field tackles. He was, you know, I mean, he, he had a couple of missed tackles. There was one where a running back kind of just bounced off of him, and you know it, that that size part of it mattered. But uh, you know, I think the Aztecs have a player. I mean, I and I know you know. That's what we were told and we reported from from his high school coach and and things of that nature. But I think as the defense has improved, I think if you want to look at one spot where for that reason, I think you, you really can look at what Josh Hunter has done. Yeah, the two things I wanted to mention, one offense, one defense. Defensively, you know, we remember the Air Force game, particularly because they were the worst passing offense in the league. And they threw for over 200 yards and three big touchdowns, right? Yeah. This week, Colorado State was one of the worst rushing teams in the country. I think they yep. are the third worst. Yep. 70 yards a game. And they had over 100 in the first half and finished with 183. Yep. That's, that can't happen, right? Like, they did a decent job against the pass offense, although uh, their quarterback missed a lot of open guys deep, a lot of overthrows mm-hmm. when guys are open. So that's – that. the defense is – performance looked better than maybe it was because of some of the missed opportunities that Colorado state could have had for bigger plays. That, that's that's that. where the defense kind of this year has been inconsistent and has done things where the hasn't been able to, they've allowed the other offense, what they're bad at to be good at it in that, in that game. And that's just, mm. we're not used to that at San Diego state. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing was the injuries on the offensive line. Cade Bennett, you know, he was out concussion. Um, he should be back this week. Didn't he should be back this week. Obviously, Ross was out, um, didn't play either. So then you've got, you know, Dean Abdullah at left guard, who I, I don't think he's taken a snap at left guard before um, in, in a game. Uh, right. Tom Marabell at center, and he was part of the center competition, but, you know, Ross had been pretty much playing center all year. And then Miles at right guard, who he had been starting there. But you could just tell – I think on each of the first three drives, they had sacks on third down. 
the first drive, the second drive, which was a safety, or maybe that was a third drive. And that was just offensive linemen getting beat around the edge. Well, that um, was the weird part is it wasn't interior. It was all, yeah. It was that all was, the- to me, that was the weirdest part. It was like, okay, here's these three new guys. And then all the trouble that they had was on the outside with the tackles. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so that, I thought that was funny. Yeah. That's the thing. Like you, the offensive line has not been doing a great job in the running game, but they, and they were struggling in against sacks early in the season, but they had really fixed that. And with so many of the changes, it really uh, reared its ugly head again. And it was the reason why they weren't able to do anything offensively in the first half. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I think probably the most maddening part and, you know, it's just so consistent that it's like, it's so consistent that I guess I'm tending, I'm starting to believe it. We've asked a lot of questions at, at press conferences about, I so said, what changed for you at halftime? What changed at halftime? And <laughs> the answer has been the same. Oh, we're just more engaged. We didn't really do anything X's and O's wise. Yeah. And I, you know, that's that not good. Up, that's not no, good. That, that came up again. That came up again in the, in the post game press conference. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those questions. I think that, that if, uh, Brady Hoke were coming back next year, it would be a question that I would wonder is like, what do you as a coach have to do to get this team to answer the bell consistently every quarter, you know? And the flip side of it is maybe a retirement does that and they're going to answer the bell against San Jose state. But I, I just thought that same kind of troubling record of, of them not showing up the first half and then somehow being able to flip the switch. I think it makes this season so frustrating because they're better than they, their record indicates potentially. Right, you are what your record is. I buy into that parcelized idea. Like it does no good to do the what if game or whatever. But the fact that they could, you know, outscore Colorado State nineteen to seven in the second half, and you're just like, man, where where was even a a fraction of that in the first half? They scored on every possession in the second half. Gabe Placencia, I, you know, I think that should be mentioned to come into that cold. <laughs> and be able to, I mean, he, he, he drilled them. I mean, those were, those were good yeah. kicks strong, obviously elevation, but whatever. And so I thought he, he did really, really well. And I thought uh, Browning punted really well. A lot of opportunities in the first half, especially made a whole game out of the first half, but I thought that they did fine. Um, Obviously the Makai Shaw fumble, um, you know, I mean, I guess it's a learning moment. He had the opportunity to dive on it and like, just dive on it. Like you, you like, even if you, you know what I mean? playing it off or whatever, just get the ball. Um, even if you didn't feel like you did it, like just like he had the chance to get that ball after. Yeah, that's uh, why it made me think, A, did he really not think he tipped it? Right. Or B, did he think he could get away with it? You know, five, ten years ago, before instant replay, you probably could get away with it if you just pretended yeah. like you exactly. didn't touch it. Uh, but with instant replay, those days are, you know, you, you can't, well, they can still get instant replay wrong as we've seen time and time again, yeah. but. You're really not able to get away with it. Last question on this game. Okay. Did you have any issues with uh, kicking off instead of an onside kick? I did not. I didn't either. I didn't either. I I, I asked the question because I'm supposed to ask the question. Because I'm supposed to ask the question, you know. I did think that it was a bummer that they had to burn their last time out in that yeah. to try to get the touchdown. I that that was, But it was the right thing to do in that situation too. But no, I had no problem with it whatsoever. Uh, you know, I... I I did think that, you know, that the, they, they had had some bad kicks. Um, Colorado State, they weren't kicking it, you know, had some good kicks as well. But I think that, you know, you would have gotten the ball anywhere from the 35 to the 50, like Coke said. Um, he said 45, 50, you know, whatever. I think if we had good field Yeah, position, it would have been tough to get it at the 45, 50, but. But 35, I mean, it's not, it's yeah. not like, I, I don't think that he was trying to, I think he was just trying to say like, and they'd had some kicks, they shanked a, a punt. That did yeah. get it. If you get any kind of return, you are at the 45 and you are at the 50. Um, you know, they've been yeah. playing, they've been doing that like rolling kick, the soccer kick or whatever it is. And, you know, if that happens to go to the up man, because they had two guys in the back. Anyway, the point is, is that it's not that far away from what he said. Yeah. And I, I do think that only needing three, um, I, I do think that that was okay. Um, yeah. And and I didn't, have, and I didn't have a problem watching the game the next day. I didn't have a problem with that either. No, nope. Um, nope. When's the last time San Diego State recovered an onside kick? Hundred percent. I don't honestly can't remember. I'm sure yeah. they have, but right. I can't remember the last time. Yeah, and so and so that we can, you know, we, can, we can all remember the last time they lo- they didn't recover an onside kick. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that, that last part for me in the game, I think that that was, that was that any other really big, important things that I thought from the game. Um, I thought Mark Redman had a nice game and I, I thought Jalen Maiden did. I mean, you know, the, the crazy part is, is I don't, I, I obviously you cannot take a safety. It wasn't like he was at the one, they were at the one yard yeah. line. He, it was a seven yard sack that went into the end zone or something to that effect. But and if then, you watch that, if you watch that play again, right, Kamara came around the edge and Mirabella was just muscled back into Maiden. Like Maiden had nowhere to step up. Maybe he okay. could have left, but Kamara would have right, would have still been behind him to take him down. But okay. like, well, may, may Mirabella, Mirabella, just, you, you got to figure out a way to take a six yard sack there. Yeah. Like you just do. And what's interesting is they lost by three, which is that safety and then having to go for two. Right. And yeah, then, no, you know, it what I mean? definitely hurts. Yeah. 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 And just interesting how that, how that came back to him. But it's never bad when you get a five zero score. It's always fun. Got to, uh, got to add a Sean Cole baseball reference in the, in the, um, recap that I wrote, you know, cause it felt like a little bit of a baseball score and, um, they, they needed a new pitcher, but let's, uh, Let's turn to San Jose State. Um, let's talk a little bit about playing some young quarterbacks. The, uh, there's no denying that Jalen Maiden saved last season yep. from potentially becoming this season, right? They were two and three. They fired a coordinator. Their top three quarterbacks were injured or uh, transferred. Like, they were in dire straits. Yep. Um, and Jalen Maiden selflessly said, I'll come back and play quarterback and won five of his first six starts was one of the top storylines in college football Agreed. nationally. Yes. Um, and he played great. Like even that one loss, the Fresno loss where it wasn't because of him. Right. Right. Uh, a lot of things happened in that fourth quarter. That was, you know, the defense gave up a lot of plays, the onside kick recovery. Uh, that we just mentioned played a great game, and so like those six games were really good. But since then, he's been very inconsistent, very turnover prone. They've lost nine out of twelve games. You know, he's a super senior. He's only got two games left, so I don't have a problem to start him. But I, you, you have to see whether you have next year's starting quarterback on the roster right now. It's obviously not Maiden because he's not going to be there. So you've got three redshirt freshmen. One's a walk on. He's played four snaps this year. The other two haven't played any snaps. They played a little bit as true freshmen before they had their own injuries last year, before Maiden took over. It makes sense to see what those guys can do. You're out of bowl con- uh, eligibility contention. You're obviously not fighting for a conference. You want to win, but just because you play another quarterback doesn't mean you're still not trying to win the game. And you never know. These quarterbacks, Odell, could come in and and make some plays that Maiden hasn't made this year, right? You know, if Coke was coming back, I would say it was foolish for him to not play these guys because right, but, but 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 you just that but that little caveat is really important. But I I also think he has to think about San Diego State's future and what's best for the future. Whether he's he's not going to be there, but if you love San Diego State like you love San Diego State, it makes sense to say these guys should get some playing opportunities. At least one of them, give them, rotate them with me. If you want to keep Maiden out there, that's fine. But rotate one or or one of them each game or something. But I, I feel like you got to see what you have in those guys, right? And you also want that next coach to know what he has in those guys. Like game uh, reps in practice and scrimmages, like those are great, but those those aren't the real deal. And I just think it's. It, it's it's best served for San Diego State's future, immediate future for next year to see what the, what these guys can do in real games. You know, it's really interesting because, uh, you know, it's obviously not our decision, right? And so I think you can approach it's it. Not. From, I, well, I know, I know, I know. I can just see it from so many different perspectives. You know, I see the idea of what you're saying about, you know, it's time to allow some of these younger guys, not not just in terms of let's see what you got, but like, um, you know, jump starting their development into next year by getting game experience this year. Um, I love the idea of Towin Odell getting his uh, first significant play because his dad was a San Jose State quarterback. And uh-huh. for them to, and from what I understand, his family will be in attendance on Saturday. 
to allow that whole thing to happen would be pretty cool. So that's one side I can completely see. Um, I can also see that Hoke would want to give Ryan Lindley as good of a resume as possible. And if Tobin Odell, um, Kyle Crum, Liu Amavai, if one or multiples of them enter the game and look like they've developed as QBs, who developed them? Ryan Lindley. Yeah. And so that would give his resume to be an offensive coordinator, either in at SDSU, if a Zach Arnett, if a Tony White is hired, right, who knows the culture, knows who Ryan Lindley is, knows the quality of a coach that he is, worked with him in the past. I thought you were going to disagree with me. Well, I'm telling you, you can get all sides, bro. I'm okay, all right, all right, cool. So I can see that. I could see Hoke saying, you know, I want to leave Ryan in the best possible spot. Plus, I mean, a- again, uh, you know, San Diego State is kind of a weird place and things don't exactly go the way that they go everywhere else. But, like, if this was every other – just the fact that they have so many young QBs on the roster already is weird. They normally yeah. don't have in the same class, and obviously – Odell as a, as a walk on, but you know, we have seen that unless you have like game footage, the people when you transfer, you, you typically don't get to transfer to a better destination unless you have game footage. Allowing, I, I mean, I'm assuming you know whoever this new coach is, there is going to be even if Hoke was the coach coming back, there would be a transfer quarterback coming in, Absolutely. and and more likely than not. Um, the quarterback who is there will be one other quarterback competing with whoever that person is, and the rest of them are going to transfer. And maybe Javance Johnson, because he's a little bit younger than them, would stay in even if he's not that person. But I mean, it, there's a good chance that Tobin Odell, Kyle Crum, Liu Amavai, that only one of those will be on the roster post spring. And if I mean, if it is like everyone else, because they want to play, and yeah. um, and so. You may want to go and say, like, these are really good kids who have done everything we asked them to do. They were put into this really tough position as true freshmen a year ago. And so we want to give them more tape. So when they inevitably have to transfer, they're going to be in a better position, too. So I could see that argument. I can also see the other argument on the other side, which is you have the last two games of your career and you want to win. And I still think that Jalen Maiden gives you the best chance to win. He is your best quarterback. And yeah, it's possible that they could be better, but ego wise, you know, if, if, you know, let's say Liu Amavai gets put into the game and he throws for 300 yards. I mean, what is everyone going to think of Brady Hoke and Ryan Lindley's ability to scout QB? They're be like, where has this guy been the entire season? How has he not been starting? Look how good he is. It's not going to change. The opinions of some is already at that level. No, I know, but it, but, but it, it, the pretending that like they're like glaciers and they're just never going to be affected by stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the other side of it is going back to, you know, the transfer portal. The only way that multiple of those guys stay and stick around, even if they're not the the person who is starting or has the best option to start next season, is if they don't can't go anywhere because they don't have any film that anybody uh, outside of the FCS level is going to want them. I mean, right. I mean, you look at, you know, um, Jordan Brookshire after he went and transferred. The only schools that were offering him were FCS schools, he told us. Um, and he didn't, they didn't fit his uh, master's work, so he didn't go. Um, Lucas Johnson, after he left, he went to an FCS school. And so, like, maybe, especially when you're young, maybe you don't want to go to an FCS school. So you're going to give it one more year, and that gives San Diego State great depth at QB next year. And that actually makes them stronger because they don't have the ability to transfer because they don't have tape. So I can just see it from a whole bunch of perspectives. I absolutely think that it makes the game about 50 times more compelling if one of those guys plays. Um, but I can see coming from both angles um, about what they're going to want to do. And I think it's a reason to tune in because, you know, it, it's it's really interesting that Tobin Odell has been the backup this entire year and what that means. And, you know, you see him warming up in, in pregame. He's got a, good, he's got a live arm. It looks to be competitive in the in the the scrimmage that he played in. You know, he was uh, minus the one pick six to Noah Tumlin. Um, yeah, you know, he was throwing the ball. He was doing all the things. So 
it'll be interesting. But um, keeping with San Jose State, I mean, th- these last two games are not easy for San Diego State. I mean, they're, they're entering into like mm-hmm. a buzzsaw. I mean, is there a hotter team in the Mountain West than San Jose State? UNLV? Yeah, yeah. After yeah, beating uh, Wyoming? Yeah. I mean, talk about how crazy that is, though. I mean, and then Hawaii, who San Diego State beat in Hawaii. Beat Air Force. In Yeah, the Air Force came into that same trip, and they beat Air Force. And, and now the UNLV and Air Force are playing each other, and – they're both one loss teams and they have the driver's seat for who will be, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's so crazy how, you know, all this stuff happened. And, and, um, you know, meanwhile, San Diego state is in there in last place. What are some of your keys to this game? Well, San Jose state has rushed over 200 yards in the last four games. Uh, they're dominating on the ground. Kyrie Robinson had 200 himself. And then their backup had almost a hundred. Like yeah. look at San Diego State, I think the uh, Keenan Christian has 330 yards, and he leads all running backs on the team. K- Jalen Maiden leads the team in rushing, but right. Keenan Christian has about, I think, 330. And uh, these guys, uh, like Kyrie Robinson had 200 himself in last game. Like, they had 300 as a team, right? So that is going to be really tough, especially when you struggle against Colorado State. That's not a good running team. And that's going to be the key is they're going to have to stop the running game. They did last year. Kyrie Robinson only had, I think, 32 yards on nine carries. Cordero was shut down from rushing, and he's a runner. And they basically made him one-dimensional. And, you know, he he uh, completed some passes, got some yards, but, like, it was a low completion percentage. The yards per attempt were low. Uh, I remember Jonah Tavai had uh, three sacks in that game, including a safety at the end in the end zone close to the press box. I remember that play really vividly. Like he just ran over the right guard, right guard or right tackle, just bulldozed him. It was like one of the, I think one of the best plays last year. Yeah. So the defense has to stop the run, you know, a secret that you want to stop the run every game, but it's imperative in this one or else they're going to get run over like Ashton Genty did to them and um, the Oregon State running back. What was his name? Martinez? I thought so, Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they need to stop the run. Um, the defensive line, after two weeks ago against Utah State, that 12 TFLs, five sacks, we praised the defensive line, and they went from that to zero TFLs in a game. Yeah. Which that's, you know, like one extreme to the other. They got okay. pushed around, and uh, they need to change that. If they get pushed around, it's going to be much worse than what Colorado State did them on the ground. It's amazing the role reversal from – you know, what San Diego State has been as a team to what they are now. Utah State came in as a pass-happy team and pounded the rock against San Diego State. Yeah. Colorado State came in as a pass-first team, came in and pounded the rock against San Diego State. Um, you already mentioned Boise State. Um, and and so, the, the, you know, San, Di- San Diego State in the Mountain West is, is, is getting a, a dose of its own medicine. For the last 13 years, they've been the one that have been pounding the rock, playing good defense. Um, and teams used to just not even <clears throat> not even dare to run the ball against San Diego State. Now that's their preferred method of attack against the Aztecs. They're saying, look, the, the secondary, uh, even with the problems that they've had with the big play, you know, we'll catch those big plays with play action. We're still going to give our, our shot, but... If we want to consistently move the ball, it's it's running the ball because they they can't tackle. And you know, I, again, that would be another great question to ask. Like, okay, great. Well, it's wonderful that you that you you know tackle and practice more than anyone else. But why isn't it working? I mean, what why is it that we're continuing? You know, I mean, even Brady will talk about like again, like we're not tackling again. You know, and and like and and what that is, and if some of that is just um, you know talent or or whatever that is, but you know, that continues to be a problem, but I think that's the most interesting aspect of it is, is like teams are going against their identity to run the football against San Diego state. I would expect that to continue. And unless San Diego state is able to stop that, I agree that they're going to be in trouble. And I think that it, it, it puts, um, you know, San Jose state's quarterback in a, in a play to, to just be where he's at, to be what he, what he can do. Well, I think he's, 
every year he's gotten better. You know, last year, his lack of arm strength was so evident in that game. And I've watched him this year and he's improved in that, um, whether it's making quicker decisions. And, you know, he I think of all of the 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 quarterbacks that San Diego State missed on. He's the one that I am the most fascinated by, because as a freshman, he came in and with his legs beat San Diego State to prevent them from going to the Mountain West Championship game. And then he transfers and you're thinking, okay, well, where is he going to go? Where is he going to go? If he's going to San Jose State, you got to imagine that San Diego State could have at least had a good conversation with him. And yeah. just where would they have been if they had gotten this quarterback as opposed to the ones that they went after? Um, and, you know, I think in your your preview, he has the most touchdowns ever by a Mountain West player. combined. Total, yeah, and rushing and passing combined. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, that's the name of the game, right? And obviously he's played a lot of games in the Mountain West, so that's the reason. But, um, you know, with 10 more, he could have just, he could have the passing too by himself with all of those BYU quarterbacks who came through the Mountain West. Like he could have the most touchdown passes and, you know, to have maybe four more games if they get to the Mountain West Championship, um, that seems more than possible. Um, and, you know, again, you, you transfer in conference and you go from Hawaii to, to San Jose State and man, you're just sitting there going and saying, why, why wouldn't he have come to San Diego State? And it's a shorter distance from the islands and, you know, whatever, whatever those things would be. So, What's um, funny, is I didn't put this in my preview, but some of the other Mountain West records, like passing yards and completions, I think like the next guy up that he can pass is Ryan Lindley. <laughs> okay i i don't know if he could, he could pass any of those in this game site so and that's part of the reason why i didn't put it in the article but like if he does play four games i think some of those uh yard uh records he could surpass ron lindley uh in some of those yeah no, that's incredible so i i think that's that's something I, you know and it, i think you know as you cover the mountain west you you get to watch a lot of mountain west football and i think he's a fun guy to watch um, he's small, yes. he's small, he, but he's just a gamer and he just plays well and he just does the things that they need to do to be successful. And San Jose state, I mean, uh, do you remember them? in I think it was 2017 with, uh, Rashad Penny. And it was like, they were playing a high school team. Yeah. And the rebuild that they've done in just a few years, I think, you know, I think that's the hope for San Diego state is they are, um, having a new coach is, if somebody can make that same jump that San Jose State made, but they can do that where San Diego State presently is at, um, then they they move to the top of the group of five. And who knows? Maybe, maybe it is their head coach um, uh, that that is that right call to to bring over. But um, you know, the, the the more that I think about it, kind of coming full circle with the conversation, the more it seems to make sense that you know, if you want somebody who's been on the West Coast who understands the Mountain West why not get a guy who's had success in the conference and you do the, the kind of the double hit of taking out the coach in your conference. I mean, you look at, you know, Nevada and where Nevada is, and obviously they beat San Diego state, um, have a great San Diego kid that we were able to, to interview, um, Jack's Leatherwood, who I think is going to, you know, get into the conversation for being a quarterback in the mountain West coming forward. Great kid, um, huge arm back from an injury. Uh, but, I mean, the rebuild that they've had to do because um, Colorado State took their head coach and like all their roster, you know, and, and maybe San Diego State can make a similar move by by grabbing, you know, a, a head coach. If you think that UNLV's thing is legit, money talks and you you now go and you take one of your West, you know, your closest rivals and you now can can do that or take San Jose State's coach or something like that. It seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. So the game is at 7.30, CBS Sports Network on Saturday. San Diego State is a 14.5-point underdog. So they've got uh, their hands full as they try to break this uh, three-game losing streak. And uh, seven out of eight at at this point. Parting thoughts before we uh, close this out? Uh, Just, you know, I I appreciate all your work, man. uh, You're going to be heading up to Vegas. Well, I'm heading to San Jose. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know. I think I got the better end of that stick. Uh, you might have. You might have. But you know what? I I am I am flying, staying, and traveling with 
Mr. Don DeMars. So, yeah. I mean, I kind of, I think I kind of get the, 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 might be the nod, not the cities, not the cities. Um, but I think I might get the nod with the company. You know what I mean? I just booked travel for the Gonzaga game with Don DeMars hey. at the end oh, of see. December. See, so, you know. Yeah, no, you're, I mean, listen, listen, and, and for everybody who is listening, uh, there are angels in this world, and then there's Don DeMars. I mean, this, this man is uh, caring, giving, um, wonderful to spend time with. I mean, in Fort Collins, man, we found this burger joint. Uh, it's like a like a smash burger place that's in Denver. And I'm just sitting with this dude and he's telling me this story and this story. And we're just, you know, pouring through all sorts of stuff, man. It, it, it was it was a great time. And I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, the people that I've been able to go on this trip and these trips, including you, you know, are definitely a big part of the highlight, um, along with covering the Aztecs, because there's a Division one team. And, um, you know, they they should have a media member um at every game and and you know we've we've this year been fortunate to be able to to make sure that happened all right guys hope you hopefully you enjoyed this episode we appreciate you guys as always for listening uh make sure to subscribe like share follow all your favorite platforms uh and uh we'll see how the aztecs do in vegas in the continental pyre main event basketball tournament and then also the football team in san jose uh and we'll talk to you guys next week you are listening to the sdsu podcast presented by the east village times with your hosts andre hackberdian and paul garrison episode of the SDSU podcast is sponsored by Mars Energy Cream, the first ever topical energy delivery product. Think energy drink, but it's a lotion. It contains a proprietary blend of natural ingredients, including caffeine, taurine, and B vitamins to provide an energizing boost. And unlike traditional energy drinks and gels, Mars Energy Cream is sugar-free, contains no artificial flavors, colors, or preservatives. If you want to try it out, Go to MarsEnergyDrinkCream.com and use the code Andre, spelled A-N-D-R-E, at checkout to receive 15% off a purchase of a 50-milliliter tube.